I'd like to introduce our um, main two speakers for today, and they'll give a brief, brief introduction of uh, their book and for today's session as well. Uh, we have Lori Brinklow and Ryan Gibson. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, I'm Lori Brinklow. I'm sitting in my kitchen in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. I decided to stay home. I've had a cold for the last 10 days, and so I'm not inflicting my germs on anybody. Um, I was the chair of the conference in Summerside uh, in 2015, and um, Ryan was the program uh, chair, and it was my first time working with Ryan, and I must say that it was such a delight that um, when the time came to think about putting together the proceedings, I knew that I wanted to work with him, and so we managed to have strike a pretty good partnership to actually come out with this book. And so people who you see here um, on the screen with us um, are some of the contributors. We have 14 contributor, or 14 chapters, but many more contributors because some of the chapters are um, authored by two people. But before I get going, I just wanted to say how the, tell us, tell you a bit about how I, we envision this um, webinar working. Um, I'll give you a bit of background into the conference, and then we're going to talk about the steps that we took to actually come up with the book, From Black Horses to White Steeds. Um, and then I'm going to be inviting, uh, we have nine or ten of the chapter authors on the call with us, and I'm asked them to do what we call like a two-minute elevator pitch about your chapter, uh, just to whet your appetite for the book. And then we will open it up um, for questions from from our panel or from our audience here. So to begin, um, the conference, the Surf and NAF, so Surf. Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation, which has been going for 30 years this year, and the North Atlantic Forum, which started in 1998 in Charlottetown. So this will be its uh, 19th year since it began, if my math is correct. Um, three times now we've hosted the two conferences together and NAV happens every two years and SURF happens every year. Um, mostly when SURF has happened on the um, east coast of Canada, we have put the two together with the North Atlantic Forum. So the first one was in 2005 in Twillingate, Twillingate in uh, St. John's or in Newfoundland, then 2011 in St. John's and then 2015 in Summerside. And now in 2019, just giving you a heads up back to St. John's, the two conferences will be together. We're always looking to bring together academics, um, whether they be faculty, researchers, students, uh, anybody that's working on um, practitioners, um, Anybody, practitioners who are working in sustainable development, sustainable communities, island communities, most island communities in the north are rural, are remote, are peripheral. Um, we share a lot of commonalities amongst Canadian rural um, communities, so there might be um, shared commonalities between, you know, say, Fogo Island on the east coast of Canada and Nelson, British Columbia in uh, the Kootenays in, in uh, so, which is very landlocked, but what the conversation happens is, you know, we always get together and we talk about the things that bind us together and how we can solve some of the challenges that we're up against. Um, other people who come to these conferences are industry people, um, NGOs. We had several at our Summerside conference. Um, we have government policymakers who come, municipalities, and it becomes a very rich conversation um, of people coming together, talking about the challenges that they have and ways to overcome it. So. The conference in Summerside, we had this um, on the slide deck, you'll see some of our um, reasons, some of the call for uh, papers, the rationale for having the conference. It was, we had about 160 people there um, talking about some of these things, you know, the interdisciplinary discussion of experiences where those living on the edge, however defined, show unexpected ingenuity in metal. And so this is the kind of thing that we're, we're going for, looking to see this conference in particular, looking to see how innovation, culture, and governance, um, different ways of, of using those tools and uh, to create sustainable communities. So um, Ryan, you can advance that just a little bit more. 
there we go. So we had three keynote speakers, um, Daniel Pottle from um, Nunatsiavush, which was the uh, um, self-governing uh, in Labrador, I believe, is where they're located. Um, we had over 60 paper presentations from all different types of community organizations and academics and students. Some of them were stories as opposed to academic papers, and so Ryan will talk about those stories when we get to the book. We had 12 poster presentations, four community tours. We went out to the um, um, far reaches of East of West Prince and uh, saw some really amazing things and talked to some really great people around some wonderful themes including half a day at Slemon Park and we're going to hear from Sean McCarville when we get to him talking about that day. So I'll turn it over to Ryan now to talk about how the book um, was split into three different what, what happened? How did we make all of those presentations become this book? It was a wonderful opportunity. Thanks, Lori. Um, we had such a diversity of, of presentations and, and stories that were being shared in Summerside uh, around these three central themes around the notion of innovation, governance, and culture, um, looking at um, the impacts of um, small communities and, and finding new resilience ways in these dark horses. And so at the end of the day, we asked um, the presenters that had shared their stories at the conference if anyone would be interested in putting um, them to paper and putting them into a book. And we were delighted that we had this wonderful crew of people that expressed an interest. And you can see all of the names that are listed on that slide. Uh, we contributors from across Canada and across the North Atlantic, uh, representing a variety of different um, but incredibly interesting innovative stories um, that were taking place throughout um, communities. And so in doing so, Lori and I had the opportunity to then take all of this information and start to put it into a book and, and start to organize it. And we ended up with three key themes throughout the book. One were, and you can see them here on the screen, the avenues to fostering livelihoods and communities. We had steps in innovative engagement and governance. And the third was around the future through stewardship and ownership. And you can see the diversity of, of topics and diversity of landscapes that are represented in the book. Um, and that was a true asset as we started to put this together. Um, and I hope it makes a, an enjoyable read as people are, are reading, th reading through it. The book itself was really exciting um, as we got an opportunity to really showcase communities from across Canada and the North Atlantic that just hadn't given up and died. They had found ways to become revitalized, sustainable, and vibrant. Um, and it was a really interesting narrative to hear all of that. And as it comes together, this notion of think global but act local uh, really started to resonate throughout the book and throughout the case studies that are there. You'll notice that um, on the next slide there, these, these, each of the chapters offers a wealth of information. Uh, in terms of how people organize themselves, how groups found um, or determined their own priorities and, and were able to utilize their local assets and sometimes had to re-envision what their assets were and how they might be able to be utilized. Um, but at the end of the day, each of the stories that are included in the book tell a, an amazing story of how those communities, those actors, um, the partners have overcome the local obstacles that were there um, to achieve um, a desired outcome, uh, to, to achieve some sort of um, new desire or new place that they would like to have, um, which was a, a wonderful story to, to have in the book. We'd be remiss not to mention that this book is a, a companion to two other books that have been produced over the last uh, decade. And interestingly enough, these books come out um, co-published um, with the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation and the North Atlantic Forum. Um, so in 2009, a few years before that, was a Surf and North Atlantic Forum conference in Twillingate, Newfoundland, where Remote Control came out, and that was um, edited by uh, Godfrey Balcaccino, Robert Greenwood, and Larry Felt. And then, more recently, Place Peripheral came out in 2015 after the Surf and the North Atlantic Forum conference in um, St. John's, Newfoundland, with Kelly Vaud and Godfrey Balcaccino and myself. One of the things that's been really exciting has been some of the reaction to the book. Um, 
working with Lori has been an absolute delight. Um, so many experiences and the, the ability to pull it all together. But we've had some really interesting comments. You can see here from Bill Reimer, uh, who was at, at Concordia University. Um, I was at a meeting actually last night among economic development officers in Ontario, and one of the women who was at the meeting said to me that she quite enjoyed the book because it wasn't a pretentious academic exercise, uh, but rather contained a whole bunch of stories that she found useful um, and found that it resonated with her organization and found ways that they could be utilized, um, which was a wonderful compliment um, that it wasn't simply or purely an academic exercise. I think there are a few other comments that will pop up on the screen in terms of um, some reaction to the book, but maybe at this point in time, and I maybe turn to Lori to make sure I've not missed anything, um, but we have a whole series of contributors that have joined us on this webinar um, that are going to share some of their stories um, and highlight some of the uh, work that was contained within their chapter to give you a flavor of the day from what's actually in the book. Great, thanks Ryan. Um, I must also mention that Ryan and I, are both names are on the introduction, but Ryan was the brains behind the introduction about changing the narrative. And I really like the idea in our introduction that he talks about how we've taken the, um, made the, changed the conversation about communities on the periphery being, um, having all of these, uh, you know, deficits, etc. But because of all of the things that he just talked about, we've managed to change the narrative. And that's what I think we want this book to do is, is let's get the positive stories out there. So Andrew Jennings is the next one up. And Andrew's chapter is on um, opportunism in, in the Scottish referendum. And uh, this, I remember when he delivered this paper, it was before Brexit, of course. And so there were lots of echoes. He had to do a little bit of update in the in the interim and which he did with with great aplomb so Andrew Jennings from Shetland Island hey, hello and um, thank you Laurie for that introduction and hello everybody else um, just a little bit of background I'm a, a lecturer at the University of the Highlands and Islands and a, I'm the program leader on the island studies uh, masters uh, here at the University and indeed I'm based in Shetland which is the most peripheral island uh, community um, in Scotland and um, we live 100 miles north of the northern Scottish uh, coastline and we're at the same latitude as Cape Chidley. So there we go, there's a, a Canadian reference uh, for you. Um, yes, so this chapter, um, it was really, it was a very simple premise. Um, there was a, a very interesting event that took place in Scotland um, a couple of years ago called the Scottish Independence Referendum, you may have heard about it. Um, and um, it really galvanised people throughout Scotland, um, got very interested in politics. And in the Scottish Islands, a campaign was established called Our Islands, uh, Our Futures, which um, was seeking um, increased island powers and um, wider recognition of island issues. Um, and they thought that if uh, they were wily enough, uh, they might be able to um, get the Scottish um, government, whether um, it became independent or not, and the Westminster government uh, to accede to some demands um, if they didn't actually come out on either side. So um, they were very clever in, in developing uh, this campaign. Um, there were certain things that they were looking for, uh, an island minister who would uh, be dedicated uh, to island issues, an island bill, which would um, mean that in the Scottish Parliament, um, there would have to be island proofing of any new uh, legislation, which would mean that the islands had to be uh, taken seriously. Um, so they, they had this campaign, and I thought it would be just a, a good idea uh, to chart the, the history of the, the campaign as it developed and put it into the context of what was happening in Scotland and the UK uh, more generally. And uh, I suppose, luckily for me, it's been a successful campaign, so it's been worth uh, charting, uh, because we now have in Scotland an island minister whose remit is to look after uh, the Scottish islands and to listen to um, island um, needs and wants. Um, he's also the, the Minister of Transport as well, which is a, a very handy uh, combination. Uh, I can tell you, um, we have difficulties with our transport here in Shetland, whether it's uh, planes or, or ferries. 
Um, and we have an island bill uh, now. It's, um, it's been presented, it was presented in June, which is just after the end of my chapter. Um, but it's gone out to, um, for in, to, to, to get um, a people's uh, opinion. And a couple of weeks ago, some of my students here in, the, in, in Shetland were actually um, answering questions to a, the Scottish Government Committee about what they wanted um, to ensure would be in the forthcoming uh, bill. So it's really just um, it's a little piece of um, modern history if you like, which is documenting the campaign, and it's um, showing that we have a good example here of island pragmatism, um, island communities banding together, like Shetland, Orkney, and the Western Isles, and managing to um, play one metropole, Edinburgh, off against another metropole, uh, London, and come up with um, some actual um, firm and fast uh, results, which we hope in the future will benefit the island communities. And it just shows uh, what can be done with a little bit of uh, cheekiness and a little bit of organization in, in your communities. That's great, Andrew. And it's funny, when we were at the surf meeting in Nelson, we were talking about rural proofing. Um, I think this is something that all of our policies need to follow that kind of a lead. Thank you for island proofing. So I, I love the idea of rural proofing in Canada. That's a wonderful introduction. And it's a really great paper. Thank you, Andrew. My pleasure. Next up, we have Brian Beaton, and Brian's um, he co-authored it with two other folks, and I'm sure he'll tell us all about it about di digital technologies in resilient remote first nations. And I believe Brian's phoning in from Fredericton, New Brunswick. Yes, I'm here, Laurie and uh, Ryan. I'm at home right now, and I thank you very much for all the work you did to make this possible to include us. Um, I'll begin um, by uh, my, uh, I'm uh, a graduate student right now, a doctoral, a doctoral candidate at the, the University of New Brunswick. I, I used to work in, out of Sioux Lookout in Northwestern Ontario with an organization called Kiwetnakuk Makanik. And um, I was the coordinator, director of the uh, development of the, uh, the broadband network, the digital network that would, uh, that the First Nations uh, led in terms of uh, developing their connections onto the internet and developing their local infrastructure as well. Um, no one else was going to do it. And so they, the chiefs um, decided that they had to move forward and they, I, I was fortunate enough and privileged to be able to uh, be, work with them to build this network over a period of about 20, 20 years. And uh, in that, uh, during that journey, we, we developed a number of applications and working with that. And we discussed that in this chapter. We discussed the, uh, that journey of uh, development, but also I think the key, key point of this one is, is that uh, it's about local ownership and control of their networks that uh, was key to their development. Um, the development led, led to the development of a cellular network that is owned and operated by the community. It led to the uh, development of their own tele uh, tele telehealth network, their own uh, internet high school that they own and operate. And uh, the, uh, the, the people that I worked with on this chapter, um, after I left uh, Kiwait Nakok Mechanic to uh, come to uh, retired, and moved to uh, the Fredericton. I, I was working with Franz Seibel. He's the he was the he was the director of the Kuwait Nakoka Mechanic uh, Research Institute, and he was my uh, liaison with the organ with the community and the organizations as uh, I was doing my research and doing the work that I was doing with the um, here at the University of New Brunswick with the First Nations Innovations Research Project and led by uh, Dr. Susan O'Donnell, who many people met at the uh, Guelph conference and also at, this, uh, at the Prince Edward Island conference. And there was a number of other people, but uh, we worked together, Franz and I worked with uh, Lyle Thomas, who lives in uh, Port Severn First Nation, right up on the Hudson Bay coast. And he, uh, 
he runs the local network and he helped us uh, gather the data that we talked about in terms of the uh, the chapter what's contained in the chapter and he also runs his own little operation that he's uh, able to um, do because of the network and so like what we were doing in the chapter was showing the resilience of uh, these communities to own and operate the networks uh, this whole network began as a smart communities uh, demonstration project and now it's spread across Canada and uh, the work that we're doing and we continue to do into the future is uh, start to work with our partners uh, and we have a, a website called firstmile.ca that we invite everyone to come to where we're involved with policy development and uh, other sharing our stories from across uh, in remote communities in uh, rural communities across Canada and so that's what I'd like to share about that chapter Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Brian. That's terrific. And um, as we know, access to rural broadband in rural in, in Canada is one of the biggest infrastructure issues that we are facing right now. And so this is a fantastic contribution to that conversation, especially about independent ownership and taking control. So I really, really appreciate your contribution to the book. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Kyle Rich, who is here, and he is going to be talking about how Trope Creek Community Center has become the center, um, how, how his community has uh, uses that as a community, a, a, um, a community development tool. So, Kyle. Thanks, Lori. Um, so I'll try to try to keep it brief, but um, broadly, this chapter was based in the community health sort of literature. So in that space, um, talking about resilience um, as the way people come together as a result of some sort of change or something that's happening in the community and the way they come together and have those experiences um, create a sense of community and then engage in some sort of collective action moving forward from that. So. The community of Trow Creek had some um, significant changes that happened in the early 2000s. So um, the highway, the main highway bypassed the town, taking flows of people out of the, the main center. Um, the school, public, public school closed and, and all of the youth were uh, consequently being bused out of the community for school. Um, and then there was the amalgamation of the community with um, a neighboring town and municipality around the outside. So. Um, within a short amount of time, there was some major changes to the context of the community. Um, and following that, um, there was some real collective action that rallied around the community center. So um, in the center of town, the arena with the adjacent hall, uh, the baseball field and the park is all included in there. So really this chapter, in this chapter, we worked with the community center board to pull this story together and talk about the ways that um, they understood coming together around um, recreation and the management and governance of the facility and the things that could happen in the community um, could be reflected in leadership and bringing people together and creating networks and, and creating that distinct sense of community um, around recreation and the facility there. So um, yeah, I want to just also give a quick shout out. I know we've got some people tuning in from Powassan and Trout Creek. So a uh, quick shout out to everyone there who's uh, tuning into this and I hope uh, you get a chance to check out the book. That's terrific. Thanks. And hey, welcome you guys from Powassan and Trout Creek. That's fantastic. Um, I hearing words like school consolidation and amalgamation. These are things that are going on in Prince Edward Island and rural communities across the country. So again, this is such a timely chapter and I'm so glad that we were able to um, include it in, the, in this book, Kyle, along with Laura, your co-writer and the Trout Creek Community Center. You guys did a great job. Next up, we have Ginny McGowan, who's gonna be talking about um, a business mentorship program for women in Prince Edward Island. But my uh, co-author, Hannah Bell, is not here. She's uh, been just been nominated to a very quick uh, political campaign that will wipe up in 26 days. So she's quite busy elsewhere. But I want to tell you about the um, project that this chapter focuses on. Um, the PEI Business Women's Association, by way of background, is, has been around for almost, oh, it's over 25 years now. And it's the only province-wide business support organization membership based in the in the province that is province wide the others are all very local um, it has a quite a large membership 
at this point and uh, is a very, very active in providing service to members. They, uh, um, the PEI Business Women's Association identified significant gaps in the business support ecosystem uh, and also with barriers facing women in general who wish to either enter the business community or were already engaged with the business community. So uh, Hannah applied for funding for, from Status of Women Canada um, for a 30-month project to, de to develop and pilot a community-based business mentoring project for women entrepreneurs. Our objective with this was also to develop an evidence base because when you looked at the literature at the concerning mentorship and um, women entrepreneurs in particular, there's very, a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence, but very, very little hard evidence either in the way of quantitative or qualitative data. So what part of our ambition was to actually add something significant to the, the research literature about what's going on. Uh, we had about 70 participants as mentors and mentees. Uh, we spent the first year in a needs assessment where we did uh, community consultations right across the province in which about almost 300 people participated, men and women um, of all ages and from various ways of life, uh, mostly from those who are in business or interested in being in business. Uh, we had an advisory board that we put together that, with representatives from various sectors, including um, government and um, also youth members and uh, from the Aboriginal Women's Association. Uh, we, we established partnerships with community organizations such as the Centers for Business Development, uh, Chambers of Commerce, not-for-profits and various government offices such as the Interministerial uh, Secretariat for Women. And uh, we, everyone was pretty excited about it because it's interesting because of its size and those of you who live on islands will probably appreciate this. It's a PEI is an ideal environment to run a pilot project. Uh, it's, it's, things are not as complicated here, it seems, that we could actually pull it off. Because as you can imagine, this was pretty complicated. We had to develop not only well, identify what was going on and develop our, our measures, we also had to actually write the curriculum for the program. Uh, I undertook a program, mentoring program management training and also gender-based analysis training through Status of Women Canada. So we added that into it. We uh, conducted a pre and post community knowledge survey about uh, knowledge and awareness of barriers facing women and the supports that are available to them. And that was quite telling. We conducted a gender-based analysis of the situation for women in, in PEI. And we engaged our, as I said, we engaged our community partners in these community consultations and reviewed the research literature such as it stood. Concurrently with the program, project rather, uh, the PEI Business Women's Association ran a Telling Our Stories campaign in which the objective was to change the narrative, change the conversation about women in business by highlighting them in a very um, dramatic way through a, a local magazine uh, that was quite popular. Uh, so the, they would tell the stories of how they got to where they are, what they were actually involved in doing and what they saw as their plan for the future. And that was extremely popular. So once we conducted the, these assessments through 2015, in 2016, we proceeded to recruit and train our mentors and recruit our mentees. Uh, the mentors were both men and women uh, for various walks of life. And uh, the mentees were of all, everyone from age 19 to 66, and from all across the island. We ran four six months pilots. As I said, about 70 people participated as mentors and mentees altogether. What did we see? Well, it was interesting. The lessons learned were, were many. Uh, we learned that you need to be flexible, it needs to be structured. We need to, the, the community, community success of the project, uh, the Telling Your Stories campaign really changed the narrative. Quite a difference from the, from the pre to post community knowledge surveys. These were surveys that were conducted online. Uh, because we learned that we give women a chance to tell stories in their own words and publicize a program like this, it can really influence the knowledge, perception, and attitudes about women entrepreneurs. We observed such transformation 
and the lives of the women that, that were involved as mentees. It was absolutely stunning. Um, we also observed that the Business Women's, Associ Business Women's Association itself benefited because of new community partners that were engaged uh, in, in new and different ways in being seen to have, be a, a credible voice uh, for women and other entrepreneurs. Uh, a massively increased presence for the organization and therefore for its voice of, as a being consulted on matters political and economic is something that's quite quite new and we really took off and um, it's now the organization is now really sought after a leader and uh, it was awarded status as an accredited book is quite different from most what you'll see. Mentees were women who were either starting a business or growing a business, uh, they, but did not have any access to um, a workplace business mentoring model uh, or program. And in that way, we were able to reach a group of people who really exist on the margins of the business support ecosystem. Um, what else can I tell you about it? We used social media quite a bit to make sure that we kept getting the word out there about what was going on and about women in business. Um, and uh, we used a, a number of different models of mentoring. We tried peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, uh, distance mentoring. We had group mentoring. Uh, we had a circle team, circle mentoring with Aboriginal women. And we had team mentoring. Um, I think that the engagement of the community partners was to us, one of the most important outcomes, uh, but also that we could see and we could, we could demonstrate with good hard evidence that there have been changes, at, not only at the personal level and the organizational level, but also at a systemic level throughout Prince Edward Island. So anyway, what we're looking for now is the funding to, to uh, build that into it from the pilot to make it sustainable. And that's a real challenge in these days. I would think that um, this would be something of, of interest across Canada and even across the North Atlantic, you know, the, the, and the way that you set about doing it is so methodical and, and your outcomes are so clear that I think, yeah, I, I support that. And I'm so glad that we are able to have told the story and uh, maybe the book is worth the price, you know, that chapter. <laughs> let's, let's get it out. Well, the, the thing is, we have a curriculum, we have all the uh, collateral you know, workbooks for the mentors and mentees, we have the training in place, we have the uh, guidelines for program manager, managers to help them to do it. So it's really uh, what we're looking for is probably to build it as like a social enterprise model. Super. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That, that was very comprehensive. Okay, next up we have Sean McCarville from uh, Slemon Park in Summerside. And uh, Sean uh, led our uh, group where we spent half a day um, listening to about four or five different speakers talking about the um, uh, um, remarkable uh, work that Slemon Park had done and continues to do. And uh, it, it's an amazing um, model for what you can do to take a, an a, decommissioned air base and make it into a hub of community development. So Sean, would you like to please tell us your story? Okay, Lori and everybody, thank you. The, uh, I'm sitting at Slum Park today. I've, I have my fifth year as the president of Slum Park. And, and I actually was the original chief financial officer as well. So I, I started here 26 years ago. So I have a fair bit of history with the overall property and was fairly close to the development history of it. So I took it upon myself to write the little history, uh, which we call the best thing that ever happened at Summerside. Uh, the property was Canadian Forces Base Summerside and it operated as an Air Force Base for 50 years. And we've been operating it for 25 plus years now as a business and a residential community. Our story is kind of a story of a bad news becoming good news story. It was, a, it was expected to be a devastating blow to the then town of Summerside to be losing its largest employer, 1,300 jobs. And one guy in Charlottetown said to me, it was the best thing that ever happened to Summerside because they'd actually tried to close the base 20 years earlier and they ended up reversing the decision at that point in time, but they didn't reverse it back in 1989 and it was going to happen. But Summerside was very fortunate to get the two major offsets for that, one being the redevelopment of the base property, which is Lemon Park. And we were also very fortunate at that time that 
government was bringing in the goods and services tax, or as the mayor called at that point in time, the, the good summer side tax. So we, <laughs> we had two significant offsets from that base closure, and 25 years later, uh, he, he was proven right, and it was actually the best thing that ever happened. To That's kind of the essence of our, our story. There were actually five presenters t telling the Summer Park story that day. We had Stephen Stewart from our, our anchor, aerospace tenant, Vector, who's been with us for, for 25 years. And, and he talked, the primary thing he talked about was the productivity of, of the workforce. And I think there's a real strength that's proven by Vector and its success going from a small business of 25 employees to now having 450 people from working here and operations on, in, on six continents managed from here. And, um, and so I think that there's a, you know, they're, they're the, the great workforce that they have based upon a workforce that wants to live here and it's a low turnover workforce and, and it's an island workforce. I think it's a workforce where islanders perhaps learn better than others the importance of working together and, and finding solutions collectively. So I think that has proven to be a very successful component of their long-term worldwide success. Uh, the other, besides there, we've created the aerospace industry, MPEI, the aerospace industry didn't exist 25 years ago. The other major anchor for development for us over the last 25 years has been training. And our anchor organization there was the Atlantic Police Academy. And so a couple of things developed from that. A lot of base closures over the years have employed that same kind of a model where they use, they, they might have uh, moved a local police academy on, onto, a, onto a former Air Force base property as part of its development. We now work with them. We have kind of a co-brand, a new brand that we established called the, called the Canadian Center of Public Safety Excellence. We do a lot of training with a lot of federal government institutions here. So we have the executive director of the Land Police Academy speaking there about, about that development over the years. The private married quarters here at former CFP Summerside, the PMQs they were called, is now our residential community. It's a most of Summer Park is outside of the city of Summerside, but the residential community is actually part of the city of Summerside. So there are 253 homes. We manage those homes. We, we, man, we market those as a full service residential community. If they're, all, they're all rental homes, but we market them as we have a lot of senior friendly activity. We renovate a number of homes to be senior friendly. And we, we market them. We, we developed a little TV commercial in recent years where we talk about a full service community. So that has been very successful. The houses had 25% vacancy five years ago, and, and they're, they're almost completely occupied now, as a result of a few developments that we had done around there. So, so that has proven very successful as well. We had one of our longtime residents, a 25-year resident here. He's a school teacher. His wife works for one of our tenants here, and, and so he told the story of living in Summer Park. And then the last speaker for us was the longtime mayor of Summerside, who he'd been the mayor for 25 or 30 years, uh, and he remembers the day very well when they announced that base closure, and he's very proud of the cooperation among the community and the, the ability to work together and, and, the, and the, for, the good fortune that the Summerside had to be one of the first bases closed and to get those two significant offsets. So there's now over 1,000 people working at Slum and Park, displacing the 1,300 jobs that had been lost with CFP Summerside. And the then town of Summerside is now the city of Summerside, and it, and it has two major two major profit centers now in the aerospace industry and in that back center that, that offset the, the, uh, uh, the, the military base that was, that was a loss. So anyway, so it's a, it was a really good news story, and it's, and it's, and it's a long-term story as well. Anyway, Laura, that's my version. That's fantastic, Sean, and he captures it really well in his chapter. Um, I just I think I remember that day so well, people coming out just going, this was the heart of the conference that morning because it just encapsulated the story of community resilience so well, taking a bad news story and turning it into something good. So I was so glad that you agreed to write this chapter for us. Next up is Carolyn Peach Brown, and I don't know is is Carolyn is on. Please speak up. I didn't hear in the in the preamble. She was um, heading up a group of uh, writers. Um, there are I think seven in the, the group. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep. And about building resilient coastal communities in the context of climate change. Um, so Carolyn Peach Brown. Hello. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this and uh, also to have been able to contribute a chapter to, uh, to the book. So our chapter focused on uh, building resilient uh, coastal communities in the context of climate change and uh, among all the challenges that rural communities, uh, coastal communities are facing, 
climate change is is a new reality uh, bringing you know changing in weather patterns increasing temperatures uh, increasing uh, sea levels um, you know increasing uh, and more unpredictable storm events uh, coastal erosion uh, as well as uh, you know changes in the marine e ecosystem with uh, uh, you know causing changes in um, you know different marine species that are commercially important for people for example lobster to uh, you know to change the places where they they have traditionally been caught so there's a lot of challenges uh, that are facing coastal communities um, and so our chapter uh, looked at uh, how communities are resilient and what uh, uh, fosters resilience in uh, these coastal communities in the face of climate change. And so some of the literature on how communities can adapt or how they can be resilient to climate change focus on different aspects of communities, many of which are highlighted in other chapters. Uh, you know, the, uh, the connection uh, that uh, communities have to uh, to the geographic place where they are, that very strong connection over many generations. Also, their knowledge, their skills, uh, the social networks that are that are there. Also, the you know the various policy networks or governance networks. And so, with all those different aspects of resilience in our chapter, we chose to focus on just a couple of them. And uh, this. Uh, this chapter brought together some case studies from uh, that were funded by various research projects. So we focused uh, on on three aspects of uh, resilience: this uh, strong connection uh, uh, that people have, this sense of place uh, that that people have, and how that fosters resilience. Also, the strength in uh, combining different types of knowledge, whether that's indigenous knowledge, uh, knowledge that might be coming from an outside source, such as a researcher or a government, um, and then also uh, aspects of participatory governance and how that can foster resilience in uh, coastal fishing communities. And so, um, so I'll just uh, I'll just briefly describe each of those uh, case studies. Uh, the one uh, focus focused uh, from uh, the work of uh, Josh McFadgen and Randy Angus uh, as part of the Mi'kmaq Confederacy looked at uh, uh, indigenous cultural values mapping, having uh, through, serious, through a series of, of different tools working with uh, the Mi'kmaq communities here in Prince Edward Island uh, to highlight areas that on, on maps that were important to them had value for various, uh, various reasons. And then using uh, uh, GIS as a tool to help uh, locate those on a map and uh, uh, compare those to uh, data that's been collected by you know, government departments as well to, be, to get an idea of where are the areas of vulnerability and how, uh, how those communities can help, uh, can then look at how they, they can choose to adapt. Um, uh, the work by Luna Kerfin and her students from the University of Waterloo uh, focused on the historic uh, 500 lot region here in the city of Charlottetown and uh, working together with uh, local people, uh, planners in, in government to, uh, in a participatory way, to uh, focus on and uh, as to what was currently happening, what they saw may happen in the future, and then to use that as a basis for discussion to be able to plan for strategies uh, for adapting. Um, so that was those two really, really highlighted the connection, the local knowledge that people have, the indigenous knowledge that people have in connecting to the places where they live. And the case study from the South Shore of Nova Scotia, particularly in Queen's municipality and the municipality of the District of, Shel of Shelburne, focused on, on harbor authorities and uh, uh, this change in governance uh, in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans over the last uh, couple of decades in terms of moving more responsibility to the local level. And so it looked at how that, those governance structures uh, worked and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, saw areas where um, you could bring in, uh, increase the, the number of people, the types of uh, volunteers who are involved in those, uh, in those harbor authorities uh, to be able to uh, build resilience as they plan for the changes that climate change will bring to, uh, to, the, uh, to the fishing communities, whether it's the infrastructure of their wharves or whether it is uh, the tourism sector or even just uh, the catching of lobster itself. So 
that's very briefly, um, you know, an overview of our chapter, but it, it highlighted, as I said, those aspects of re resilience in terms of the strong connection that uh, rural communities have with their place, that um, where they have a deep knowledge of, of the area. Um, and also then how sometimes outsiders, whether it's government, researchers, can also uh, uh, using various tools uh, that are participatory in nature can help those communities uh, uh, to combine that knowledge with other knowledge, uh, external knowledge to help them uh, become more resilient uh, to, uh, to climate change. So thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your attention. Great, good job, Carolyn. I know how difficult it must be, have been wrangling all um, six authors <laughs> into one, uh, one wonderful chapter that I think will be a great model for others, communities that are trying to deal with aspects of, of climate change and it's something that's on all of our minds these days. Uh, next up, we have Angela Pollock and I think she's probably calling in from Ontario. And she is, her topic is on idea tourism, modeling a social and human capital tourism. And and I loved her chapter all about storytelling. Angela. Hi, Laurie. Thanks a lot for including me in this. I'm thrilled to be included in the book. And the conference was wonderful. It was great to attend. Uh, this chapter comes out of my doctoral dissertation research. I'm in the, li the School of Library and Information Studies. Uh, right now, I finished my degree at Western in Ontario. And right now, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Alberta. And during the course of my research, it was, it became pretty obvious pretty quickly how um, focused our discipline is, my discipline, on information that goes back and forth in urban contexts. But things that happen in rural contexts are often negatively portrayed or um, subject to stereotypes or even worse, they're just absent entirely. And so over the course of my research, I came across a, a number of instances of tourist-based um, businesses that had developed out of the needs that rural communities face, such as the out-migration and the uh, economic instability, um, monoculture economies, and so on. And when these, when these economies, or when the, the businesses that are focused on these monoculture economies disappear, then the communities have a lot of trouble sustaining themselves because that's what they're built on and what they're built around. And over the course of my research, I noticed that there are communities in different places that have popped up with um, solutions based around the tourism industry that counter this deficit that's left behind. And that's really what I wanted to focus on in this chapter. And so it's the convergence of a couple of disciplines that I'm looking at. One is leisure studies, one is library and information studies, and then of course rural studies. And what they all seem to have in common is this idea of tourism. And now tourism is often broken down into many different subsets. So you've got, you know, educational tourism or um, destination tourism and dark tourism. There's all kinds of different types of tourism. But what they all have in common is the fact that a lot of these tourist businesses focus on the idea of bringing people together in rural communities in order to learn something or to experience something in these uh, specific environments. And so I was looking at, first of all, why is it that these communities are marginalized in the literature? And then how can we find the resilience and find the resources within the communities to build these tourism businesses around the, the place, the unique places and the unique cultures that are found in each of these communities? Um, and so revitalization through tourism is not something that's particularly new, but the idea of helping communities develop their own unique brand of tourism is something that I think is, it's not been done before. Maybe you know, people have talked about it, but how that actually happens is still a relatively unknown. So we have communities like Fogo Island that have been redeveloped um, around a tourism business. There's another in the United States in, I believe it's North Carolina, based around the folk school model. So these uh, businesses, they bring people to the communities and they experience the local culture there. In the case of the Campbell Folk School in North Carolina, they bring people for classes on different tourist, different um, craftsmanship that's local to the Appalachian Mountain region. And so my thought is, why can't this happen in more places around the country? 
And I think the reason largely stems from the fact that communities don't have the resources to be able to do this type of work, the research work or the development work on their own um, in order to bring businesses like this into existence. And so <clears throat> this chapter advocates for um, some research into a model for how that can happen and the different, probably many different models for how it can happen in different places around the country. And it also, um, I've also focused on advocating how we can change the narrative a little bit from rural being absent from the larger conversation to becoming more important. And that focuses around valuing things that happen in these everyday spaces a lot more and more often. Um, typically, we don't pay a lot of attention to what happens in everyday life, and we certainly don't document it very much. Um, and yet in our systems where we propagate information, a lot of that is based on documentary sources of information. So we have to find a way to value what's happening in everyday life spaces and to get around this need to document everything um, and then find a way to change the conversation um, around what's happening in these rural spaces so that the stories that are attached to these communities can come to the forefront because I really believe that um, the power is within these communities to become self-sustaining. So that is my little spiel, short and simple and Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. No, that's that's fantastic. This just represents again the power of this book to to have these different ideas that can be replicated in other places or adapted or even just to spark the conversation and and to help sustainable communities and resilient or communities become more sustainable and resilient. So thanks, Angela. Um, next up, we have Paul Crayley. Yes. Hi. Hi, Laurie. Thanks for that. Um, so the uh, discussion I'm doing um, is uh, planning the resilient community using living green infrastructure as a foundation. And uh, this is something uh, that I've been following through um, a large portion of my life. I'm currently a um, PhD candidate at the University of Guelph. And um, the case study is basically uh, looking at how we can use the environment as a, as a tool um, to um, benefit uh, community um, development. And I'm looking at it from a land use planning perspective, uh, which is, again, my background, and uh, attempting to assist municipalities, big and small, uh, to address challenges that, that, they, that they face. Um, so the planning system that I'm... Uh, exploring or the chapter explores is uh, the use of green living um, infrastructure and combining that with our traditional gray infrastructure which consists of the buildings roads and pipe services in any community and um, the inspiration for for this uh, review comes from the millennium ecosystem assessment from 2003 where a conceptual framework was laid out illustrating how goods and services of nature um, can set the basis for healthy functioning, um, both for the natural worlds, but as well as for human uh, endeavor. Uh, Tusalas uh, et al. in 2007 uh, further um, followed up on that assessment by uh, highlighting the values from ecosystem services uh, the services that support, produce, regulate, and provide cultural components for all our human endeavor. Uh, so that set the basis for this green infrastructure planning system, which uh, has a lot of buzzwords in it, but uh, multifunctional networks combining natural system together, um, uh, holistic views of things of how to incorporate your green elements in a community to, again, assist the human condition. Um, green um, goods and services in the nature can uh, be used uh, to be monetized uh, in relation to our economic system, uh, can also build social capacity uh, for our social cultural system and also um, look at how our governance structures can support it. In terms of the chapter, I have given a uh, definition of what is meant by green infrastructure planning. I go through some of the challenges that uh, rural municipalities uh, face um, in being resilient. Uh, I do a brief uh, literature review of different places indicate that this is not necessarily a new concept, that the garden cities that uh, were constructed at the previous century uh, and, um, can, and can still serve as inspiration 
some newer uh, notions, the green belt, for example, around the Toronto centered region uh, is something that uh, can ins give inspiration. Um, I've looked at case studies for in Europe um, and again in uh, the Northwest uh, Green Infrastructure Guide from England uh, lays out uh, mechanisms to a deal with greenhouse gases, uh, attenuation, floods, intense summer heat uh, across the U.S., which is primarily looking at stormwater management issues. And uh, in Canada, um, through some of the uh, initiatives of the Green Infrastructure Ontario Coalition, as well as the provincial government in their provincial policy statement. So in terms of the details in the chapter, I lay out various um, examples from recent work that we did uh, with the um, uh, Agricultural Ministry here in Ontario and the, and the University of Guelph around eight themes, community livability, biodiversity protection, woodlots, street trees, uh, water, stormwater management, impacts for local food production, uh, tourism and recreational efforts, climate change mitigation adaptation, and other environmental stewardship initiatives, uh, such as uh, working with NGOs and the alternative land use system uh, services. So overall, uh, there's a lot of individual aspects of green infrastructure uh, planning that are underway, but not any strategic initiatives. So I led that as a, as a great opportunity to uh, follow up in my PhD work. And I, um, as a footnote, I, I noticed uh, the green um, uh, belt uh, foundation here in Ontario has just released a green infrastructure guide for spark communities or, or for small communities. So I would encourage folks to look at that um, as, as a means of how you can implement green infrastructure planning while I continue to finish my uh, PhD work here at the university. So that's, thank you for the opportunity. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And again, another example of how uh, our research that, uh, you know, very valuable uh, research that's coming out of our universities can actually be used in communities. And so, Paul, thanks for doing that, what we call knowledge transfer in, in your chapter. That's super. Um, finally, we have Brendan. I hope Brendan's, uh, um, Brendan O'Keefe from Ireland. His uh, microphone is working. He and David Douglas are in the same room in, um, in Ireland. So Brendan's talk was called, or Brendan's chapter was called Surviving or Thriving? Perceptions of Rural Vibrancy in Ireland. So Brendan, take it away. Thank you very much, Laurie. I hope everybody can hear me now, yes? It's a little soft. I don't know. Maybe you can sit a little closer to your microphone. I'm turning it up there now, Laurie. Is that Excellent. better? Good. That's, that's good. I, I, I moved around the wires earlier on there. Thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute to this and to bring a, another voice from this side of the Atlantic to the table and indeed for the opportunity to have the chapter in the book. As the title says, it is a perceptions study. Um, and in beginning to look at perceptions of vibrancy, resilience, vitality, and all of those words that we tend to use interchangeably. We looked at the literature, we looked at the definitions, we looked at some of the indicators of community vibrancy. And I do need to acknowledge the work of SEAL in Canada in that respect, in defining and operationalizing some of the indicators of rural vibrancy. The other feature of our work here was that we worked in parallel with communities. So while this wasn't, you know, in the strictest sense of the definition, a piece of action research, it was very much led by communities. So once we had defined rural vibrancy, we talked to the communities about the indicators and we looked at refining them and we looked at adapting them to local needs with a view to community planning. Um, so we were just not looking at measuring vibrancy, but looking at how we would cultivate, how we would stimulate, how we would promote vibrancy in communities. And we did this work specifically in South Kerry, which is a very beautiful place, as Ryan will testify, in the southwest of Ireland. It's coastal, but it also has some inland areas. We picked it as an area that has, and it's, it's almost like a, a cross section of rural Ireland, going from the peri-urban to the remote peripheral and indeed island communities. And our study had a number of strands. The first strand was a mapping of public service provision in each of the communities. And that was largely quantitative. 
The second strand involved working with civil society organizations. And the main observations coming from this were, were the very, very significant contributions that civil society, that community and voluntary organizations are making to the promotion of community resilience. And in writing our report, and indeed in writing the chapter, we tended to celebrate that as, you know, the civil society driving resilience and doing so in a bespoke manner. But then when I got the book, I was very interested to read David's foreword and his questioning of this um, agenda and, you know, asking questions about the state, government, and the role of the state in providing services and the fact that there is a tendency now to offload and to outsource what should be state responsibilities to communities. So we need to be cautious, if you like, in celebrating the contributions of civil society and look at, you know, is there partnership and what role civil society plays and is, and is it meaningful? But the main plank of the study that's in the chapter is that folk, which focuses on um, and draws from a survey of citizens. We surveyed nearly 1,000 people, and we looked at their perceptions of economic vibrancy, sociocultural vibrancy, and environmental vibrancy. And to sum up the findings, we found that levels of economic vibrancy tended to be higher the closer one got to the urban areas. And whereas in the more peripheral communities, people were, you know, concerned about economic development and they perceived the local economy to be much less vibrant. Now, that's not a, a major finding in itself, but it's useful to have that data. Then we also looked at the socio-cultural vibrancy and we found that this was in reverse, the reverse of the order of the economic, um, in, 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 in a spatial or geographical sense. We found that socio-cultural vibrancy is measured by things like festivals, community organizations, levels of participation, facilities for young people and so on, were much better in the more peripheral communities. And we attributed this to the Little Red Hen philosophy, whereby people could see gaps emerging in terms of local service provision, and therefore they felt they had to do it for themselves. Um, so we found that not only did we get measures of vibrancy, not only did we quantify on various scales levels of vibrancy, indeed resilience across communities, but having gone through this exercise, we were able to identify the specific areas in terms of communities, but also the specific issues and themes that communities felt were performing well, and those that were underperforming or needed more support and needed more investment. So since our study was done, and indeed since the book came out, communities have been continuing to use the data for community planning. And more recently, we were involved in, just about a month ago, doing a geo-design workshop with one of the communities that participated on the study. So you started something very good um, in PEI, and it, that's really has gathered momentum here locally. So thanks again for that. Oh, that's wonderful to know that it's something that started, you know, here and it continues and, and grows and it's such a model for the rest of us. I know in island studies, we've talked about um, um, vulnerability index and then resilient index. I'm hearing vibrancy index, I think, for communities. I think that's a, that's a wonderful addition to the, um, the, the literature that we're talking about. Um, David Douglas, um, we had asked him, I, I think it, I said at the beginning, to do a retrospective of... Um, um, what was has happened in Canada in the way of community development and so he wrote a very fine introductory chapter our 15th chapter actually in the book it's the very first but it was there were 15 altogether I only want to say three other things and then I'm going to turn it over to Michael to moderate any questions that might be out there from our participants there were four papers um, four authors well five now including David who weren't here today on the call um, that included um, Emily Thomas who talked about fisheries and Maine in Newfoundland, Peter Dene from Germany, uh, talking about um, rural Germany and the Romponnier, uh, which is a really interesting um, movement in Germany, people moving um, out of the cities into the rural areas and revitalizing, re 
and making them more vibrant. Uh, Peter Clancy and Mario Levesque talked about the um, environmental governance in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and did a case study on the, the Confederation Bridge, which is a topic near and dear to my own heart. And Kim Kennedy, Kimberly Kennedy, talked about innovative education projects, um, partnerships between her college, Olds College in Alberta, and rural communities. So it's a very, very fine chapter as well. So um, I think it's just an amazingly rich collection of chapters, and you've just um, heard most of them today. Uh, two other things, I wanted to thank a few of the team that helped put the book together, the peer reviewers, of course. Um, they did uh, yeoman service in pulling together um, paper, um, comments for our various authors and uh, the authors then took it back and did some great revisions to make make their chapters as good as possible. Valencia Gaspard at the University of Guelph came through at the 11th hour and made us a really fine index and in like record time and of course Joan Sinclair who did the amazing um, work on pulling together the book and she's a designer with Island Studies Press the managing editor there as well and she put the whole thing together in time so that we could launch it at the conference in Bo in Norway, or Bo as it's called, the um, North Atlantic Forum, and at the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation conference in Nelson. Finally, I just wanted to say the value of this webinar. It's just incredible. To, there's no way we could have brought all of you guys together and in, um, at a book launch. And so I'm thinking that this is an amazing book launch. And, and um, I'm thinking also that I want to make sure that the, the uh, website, or the link to this webinar gets put on all of our promotional materials for this book. I was a book publisher before I became an academic. And so I see so strongly the value in um, all of you contributors telling your stories, giving an overview of your chapter and what it might mean to um, potential customers out there. So feel free. I encourage all of us to um, share the links widely so that we can sell the books. So Michael, I'm going to turn it back over to you now. Sure. And uh, as you mentioned, Lori, this uh, will be up on the RPLC YouTube channel. Uh, this webinar, along with all of our webinars that deal with rural-related issues, uh, are available for viewing from the past three years of our project, and we have another three and a half years of the RPLC project to go. Um, for anyone who is still tuned in, of course, this is your opportunity to ask questions of uh, Lori, Ryan, or any of the other contributors to the book. Please type your question into the Q&A box. I'll, uh, I'll read your questions. You can type them and then I'll read them and pose them to uh, the presenters and uh, we can have a, a nice little chat. Um, while we're waiting for that, uh, I actually kind of have a question, if you don't mind, and this is open to all of um, our speakers today, because with the Rural Policy Learning Commons, of course, we're always interested in uh, the rural narrative as a way of helping um, influence or, or guide uh, rural policymakers and in any of your experiences, are there any observations, uh, specific observations that you can see that would help guide what any local policies or provincial policies or federal policies, um, any, anything that you could add to that conversation? How do we raise our hand? Yeah, I guess or do you, I just speak? <laughs> just speaking is good, yeah. Okay, so I have something to add. Um, coming from the library world, libraries business is all about stories and narrative, and we work with policy, we work with community development, um, outreach, all of these good things. And just to throw this out there to everybody who's listening or who will listen in the future, uh, libraries are a great resource for helping with narratives and to help push the narrative of your community out. But we have a really big problem with funding. Um, libraries are funded based on the um, number of residents in a community. And of course, that means the smaller the community, the less funding the library has, which hamstrings them in their ability to be able to do that. So my first suggestion is turn to your library anyway, because if they can help, they will. And the second is when you're lobbying or when you're um, looking for addition to resources to help you with this work, don't forget to ask for resources for your local library because they have the skills, they know how to do that work, they know how to pull narratives together, they know how to interact and work with uh, many different government organizations. But 
when you only have a budget for, you know, 12 hours worth of work a week for a librarian, you can't get very much done. So that's a, my two cents from my corner. Yeah, I have a follow up to that a little bit because I know here in Manitoba, it's also based on our per population. It's recommended that municipalities put $8 and 50 cents uh, per resident into um, a library um, funding situation. Is, is there a, a specific amount that they have in Ontario that you're aware of? So there's municipal funding and then there's provincial funding. And yep. in Ontario, the provincial funding sits around, I think, $4 per resident or mm -hmm. something. And that hasn't changed since the 1990s. So it's woefully inadequate. Um, and it's different across all of the country. Like every province has its own um, funding model. So there's no consistency from province to province. Yeah. And as far as other social services, I know I work in the recreation world. Um, there's been talk of, you know, libraries has 850, but there's no guideline for how much municipalities should put towards recreation. But that's aside from the point. Is any other, of our other speakers care to add to if their observations um, and, and um, thoughts about how it could influence policy? Uh, Brian, yes. yeah. um, I just wanted to uh, just add one of the things that we've done out of our research project, uh, the First Nations Innovations Project, is we set up a not-for-profit organization to start um, uh, with the, the directors being the First Nation organizations from across Canada. And we, we refer to them as intermediary organizations that contribute to, uh, that are supporting the communities. And I think one of the biggest things is having that network in terms of developing policy and being able to influence policy with uh, this new organization that we established, we're now writing, uh, taking on, able to take on uh, government uh, departments, which we've been doing and writing reports and also influencing um, at the, for the telecommunications aspect of it, the, uh, the uh, Canadian Radio and Television or the Telecommunications Commission and their work as uh, because you have to contribute to their their decisions in order that they can consider the information. So the voices being able to add voices, uh, the the rural and remote community voices to the dis the discussions is critical. And like rather than it being done from an urban environment, it's um, allowing these communities and these organizations to be able to formulate the policies and uh, suggestions that support their needs and their priorities. Thank you, Michael. And I, Paul, you're about to say something? Yeah, I just had a, a comment. So through the, through the research, I guess the common uh, feature through a lot of the case studies on dealing with natural systems, um, it was local, um, persons or key um, interested folks. It could be an NGO, an environmental NGO, wanting to do a good work in a particular place. But um, it was very grassroots uh, bubbling up that um, created the incentive to, to do something with your natural assets in, in the local area. And um, that was what the beauty of green infrastructure. It can manifest itself in a variety of different um, mechanisms. So it was both the stakeholders at the local area recognizing something they had to have done. And the other thing was a calamity. Usually it had to be some uh, flood or um, drought condition or something to motivate action. Um, human beings are very slow to change uh, from their past behaviors, I suppose. And um, um, that was another key feature that uh, there had to be something that sparked um, people coming together to overcome adversity and um, nature can throw us a lot of uh, curveballs. So um, anyway, that's, that's my comment. That's good. So you're suggesting we should have some natural calamities because then it'll cause people to act. That's it. We'll, we'll work on that. I think there's a movie called that, Geostorm. Um, we have uh, a couple questions, all jokes aside, uh, from Kyle and uh, Ray Bowman. The infamous Ray Bowman would like to ask a uh, question to Ryan. Uh, Andrew suggested that Scottish islands started working together and then they were treated as a political entity. 
Do you think that if Northern Ontario started working together, would they get treated as a political entity? Great question, uh, to which I have no definitive answer. Um, I, I think that in itself could be a wonderful webinar. Uh, I th a couple of thoughts come to mind. One is um, the boundary of the Scottish islands, um, in a sense, was much easier to define in the sense that you are, you're, you're on the islands or you're not, whereas Northern Ontario as a, as a unit is a little more tricky to, to determine where boundaries exist. Um, which make it a bit more of a, um, a hot potato to, to, to balance. Um, but I have absolutely no idea. Um, it would be an interesting thing to, to discuss, and I'm sure there are others on this call that might have a perception of it, uh, but others that we know that would love to jump into that conversation. I'll just add that um, down here in the Atlantic area, Atlantic region, people have been talking about maritime union for decades, and people on Prince Edward Island um, eschew the conversation because Prince Edward Island has always had been so independent and, and uh, wanting to go its own way that um, to become part of Maritime Union is just something that is not in the cards. So you're, you're balancing that, you know, idea of economies of scale by bringing things together in services or whatever that Maritime Union might Bring, but the fact that people are so independent spirited that you're, you're, it's probably never going to happen. I, I'd like to add too, uh, Michael, to raise a question. Uh, having lived in uh, Northern Ontario and I return there um, all the time, it, I, a lot of the decisions that end up getting made uh, about working together are nullified or, or prevented in a number of different ways um, over and over again in terms of research at the uh, academic level, like you know, in terms of the applications that are made to uh, work together, uh, it gets denied. A lot of it is, is all about uh, divide and conquer, even among First Nations. Everyone here has, is, recognizes that concept. and. Uh, and the need for the resources that are in the Northern Ontario today, like, you know, to clean water, power and energy, lumber, mineral extraction, that need feeds urban environments. And, uh, and therefore, it's often very difficult to be able to um, solidify that kind of working together and uh, uh, uni uniting uh, that, those efforts. And so, People have been doing it, and people are doing it in a number of different ways, but it's, continually, it's a continuous struggle that ends up taking place and for all the different reasons. Thank you. Great. Uh, I have another question here from Mr. Kyle Rich for Ryan and Lori. What is missing? If there was one chapter that you could add, would it ta what would it tackle, or what questions would you ask what would you like to add to the conversation narrative? I'll, um, I, was, I saw the question there and I've been thinking about it for a few minutes. The policy, how does policy happen? Like how can we influence policy? To have somebody who is a policy maker to have written a chapter to give us some insights into how the magic world of policy seems to, to work because um, we, we tried at the Summerside Conference, we had an, uh, initiated a project of writing policy briefs for our students and the project is still hanging fire and uh, we would love to, to make it happen, but to teach our students how to, to write policy. But I think that's the sort of thing that it, it's this, this world, this mysterious world, like how do you take ideas and then make them happen? And perhaps it is through policy. Right. Any thoughts? Yeah. I was actually going to suggest a very similar chapter uh, around how to move some of the, the work into policy, but also into practice um, on that front, as there's a tremendous amount of ideas that are there. I think there's a tremendous amount of energy amongst readers. It's just a matter of how to connect the two uh, and to move into shape in the right directions. Great. 
Um, well, uh, that kind of ends it for our question, or are there any others? There was one more from Brian there. Oh, yeah, just came up. For the surf folks, are additional publications coming from Guelph Conference and the Nelson Gathering? I don't know. I don't know. Ryan, do you know? It's my understanding that I believe there are a number of different things that are emerging from both of those conferences. I'm not sure that they'll take the shape of a, an edited volume, um, but I do know that there were discussions with different thematic areas about uh, perhaps publishing in a joint journal or in other forums um, to have that information shared. All of the individual presentations from both Guelph and the Nelson Conference are available on conference websites. And so anyone can go and collect that information. Uh, and I do also believe that there are a series of um, the discussions that took place in Nelson that are also available on um, YouTube, on the Rural Policy Learning Commons YouTube channel um, that were captured uh, that people can, can join or to, to take part in or share them with other folks. Um, I know through the North Atlantic Forum, we are, I was been working with the conference chair there, Gudrun Helgedotter, to come up with a, um, a, perhaps some kind of proceedings coming from that one. That was the Boa Conference, and some themes emerged, which uh, we would hope to be able to launch at the Joint Surf NAF Conference in 2019 in, um, in St. John's. Great. I'd like to thank everybody, of course, for um, coming to today's session. Uh, Laurie Brinklow, Ryan Gibson, uh, Andrew Jennings, Sean McCarville, Kyle Rich, Angela Pollock, Paul, Paul Creeling, Brian Beaton, Carolyn Brown, and Brendan O'Keefe for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar, uh, as I mentioned, is going to be recorded and available at the RPLC YouTube page. Uh, we will forward that link to all participants who participated today. And uh, for future reference, the Black Horses, the White Steeds, Building Community Resilience celebrates the critiques, the dynamics of innovation, governance, and cultural in place. This webinar will explore three of the case studies from the book that focuses on the strengths and local initiatives, the impacts of collective power, and re-envisioning the local assets. Thanks again to everyone for joining us today, and uh, hope that you have a good day.